chapter 3 and verse 18. For those of you here for the first time, as Pastor Radio was sharing there, we're, we're in the latter parts of a series on marriage. It's called, Do You Believe in Life After Love? One of the primary mistakes I think a lot of people make is we think that falling in love is all it's about. Falling in love is the easiest thing in the world. But it's the life that comes after that that causes the trouble and, 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 and takes a lot more handling. Let me ask, start this morning by asking you a question. What is the first not good in the Bible? Well, as you begin to read in Genesis, God says many things. He says, you know, he made the trees and they were good. He made the fish and they were good. He made the cattle and they were good. And then all of a sudden you come across the first not good of the Bible. And it's something that pertains to man. It's in Genesis chapter 2. Sorry, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And you see right from the very beginning, the foundations of the earth, you see that mankind was made for relationship. You have been built for relationship. It's fundamental to who you are. Now, primarily a relationship with God, of course. And as much as we crave for that with our, the spiritual half of us, but likewise... You need relationship with people, right? All humanity, whether they're aware of it or not, crave God. That's why they worship other things. But you, you crave God, but you also crave intimacy with other people. And these three things, God, you, and another person, they all come together in marriage. That's where they really find their home. Now, the Scripture says a, a threefold cord is not easily broken. And that's actually technically true. Engineers tell us that the, a, a threefold cord is the strongest cord because when you twist it, at all times, all parts are touching the other. So the more you pull it, the stronger it gets. Now, you, <laughs> another, what's that third part again? God. And if only we could get God, if only we would just hear and perceive and obey the basics, our marriages would be so much happier, so much better. Get God into the center of your marriage and you cannot fail to have a strong marriage. Amen. You can't fail. But it's these primary silly mistakes of excluding Him or whatever it is, weaknesses, that particularly men fail to do that. Last Sunday night, we began to look at some of the enemies of intimacy, some of the things that drive couples apart all over the world. And the first one we looked at was anger, how that can really affects, affect a couple's sex life. The Bible says this, don't let the sun go down. Don't go to bed. Don't get into bed with anger towards your partner, towards your husband, or towards your wife. And definitely don't try and make love under those circumstances because you're going to do damage to a person in that scenario. You need to resolve the anger just like the Bible says. It's one of the main issues. Obviously, God draws out his anger. It's not the only one. There's many, many others we'll look at in weeks to come. But the, do you know the heart of this series? It's simply this. How do we build lasting relationships? Relationships don't seem to last too long anymore. Falling apart so quick. One year, two years, three years. So many people get so unhappy so quickly. That's not right. That's never biblical. So in the evenings particularly, we've been looking at how did we lose that intimacy that we crave? You don't just crave intimacy with God. You also crave human intimacy, to be close to another person. And God's provided for that, of course, through friendship, but through marriage. And I want to establish today a, a principle in your mind that can last you for the rest of your life, and it concerns how we approach this whole sensitive issue of intimacy. Intimacy must really function on three levels if it's going to be effective at all. Spiritual intimacy between husband and wife. Soulish intimacy. 
and sexual intimacy. If you remember when we did discipleship, we looked at the 3D, how every Christian should be, first of all, a disciple of Christ, and then secondly, the disciple of another, and then thirdly, a discipler. One of the most important things to remember about those three is this. They're not independent. You can't pick one out of the bunch because it doesn't work that way. They need to work in concert. You need to have all three active for the thing to actually kick in in your life. And so it is within marriage. These three, spirituality, the, the, the soulish part of your husband or your wife, and sexuality cannot be put into isolation. That's where the trouble starts. So let's analyze them then, starting with spiritual intimacy. Do you know this? Listen. They gathered together a bunch of women and they said, Ladies, married women, would you say you have spiritual intimacy with your husband? And some of them, hands go up and they said, Yeah. And some of them, they didn't. They took the women who put their hands up and separated them. And they said to them this, what is it then? It's a term. But what is that term? What actually is spiritual intimacy? What form does it take within your marriage? And the answer was not too surprising. The women said, well, well, it's like this. When there's any problem facing us as a family, my husband will sit me down and he'll talk about it. We will share it. And we will see what way we're going to proceed through Scripture. We'll see the parameters God gives us. We'll see how we have to act in faith. He will lead me in that, and then we will share together. If there's a problem in our relationship, my husband will sit me down, and he'll say, look, there's something wrong here. And we'll pray over one another. We'll pray for each other. That's the form it takes. And then they got a bunch of men. <laughs> sat them down. And they said, men, those of you who think you've got spiritual intimacy with your wives, put your hand up. And the men who did, they took them aside. And they said, well, what form does it take? And the answer was very similar. Those guys said, well, simply this. All the issues that face us relationally, as a family, financially, I bring them with my wife and together we pray about them. Together we discuss them. There's no rocket science there. Very simple, but so bonding, so lovely when that actually happens. I think it would be fair to say that women distrust men <laughs> more than men distrust... Sorry, women distrust men more than men dist distrust women. Would you agree? I think that's probably, I'm generalizing, but it's probably true. Listen, guys, it doesn't help the situation if you don't pray. If, if women typically, you know, have that little inkling of distrust towards men, it doesn't help it if men don't therefore pray in the home. It doesn't help it. It will only exacerbate it. And she's going to feel more insecure, Right? I don't think anything would make a woman feel more insecure than that, in fact. And nothing would make a woman feel more secure than to know that her husband is in tune with God. To know that he's seeking God. To know that he's hearing from God. You know the number one things I could ask, but you won't get it. You won't guess it, because you wouldn't know. Number one things wives complain about with their husbands. <laughs> Lack of decisiveness. It's the number one thing. The most common complaint. He won't make any decisions. And I know where that comes from. It comes from lack of confidence, which comes from lack of communication with God. Someone who has a word in them is confident to make a decision because they've been seeking God. Amen. So you see the, the opposites here. If, if, if the woman feels that her husband is not seeking God, of course she's going to feel very insecure. And conversely, if that man is hearing from God, seeking God, she's going to feel very, very, very secure. Now, we're actually changing our prayer lives quite considerably now, myself and Jeanette, but I, I can testify to this over the years. When you've prayed with someone for a very long time, I know when she's heard from God. 
I know when she might have heard from God. And I know what I know. No, you didn't hear from God on that one. You know. There's a big difference. And, and, and the same the other way around. She knows when I've heard from God. And there's been some really testing times. Some examples that are just shocking. Remember, for example, think of the effect it has on your wife. Remember the example I told you. We're standing in our living room looking through the blinds. And there's a guy mowing his lawn across the street. Remember that? I told you about that. And Jeanette and I are praying. And I look at this guy and I begin to prophesy. And I say, when the police come to collect you, you are not going to fight back. You're going to go peaceably. You're going to go like a lamb, in fact. And you're not going to upset, because you have two kids, you're not going to upset the children. Now your wife's standing there looking at you thinking, he's really flipped out. Listen to this. Now you can imagine that could make a woman feel insecure. But it doesn't half make her feel secure when the police van pulls up. It doesn't half change her perspective of her husband when they put the handcuffs off him. And the thing her husband was prophesying two minutes earlier takes place before her eyes. I remember nudging her one day and saying, do you see the guy with one of the businessmen in our church? We thought he was a businessman. I just had a vision of him. He had a yellow hat on. Something was going to kill him. We're going to pray for him. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's a businessman. He's not a workman. He's not on a building site. Two, three weeks go by. We're stuck in a, a motorway jam. There he is, yellow hat and all, right on a building site. That doesn't half make someone feel secure because they think you're hearing from God, and that's fantastic. Husbands, don't underestimate it. You need to be that. You need to provide that. Why do women get married anyway? Main reasons are for reasons of security. Right? It's just a fact. Physical security, financial security, spiritual security, and basically feeling insecure. And they think if they get married, those things will go away. Emotional insecurity. But if those things aren't there, it can be a very, very disappointing road. And let me say, wives, if your husband is not the best, that is not an excuse to backslide. If your husband's not the best husband in the world, he needs time. He needs time to grow, but each one of us must give an account to God for our own lives. It's no good God say, well, I'm in this state. Oh, Lord, because of him. No, sorry, that won't wash. You're responsible for your own life, and you can't pass the buck to anybody, no matter what the circumstances might be. But these are, these are points that are not in your notes, actually. So if you're taking notes, you may want to write these next five points down. Simple things, then, about husbandry. We don't know what husbandry is. We don't know how to look after our wives unless we're guided and we have a, a role model to follow. Number one, men, make sure that your wife has got fellowship with God. The point we made last week, do you remember what we said? If the woman is out of sorts, if she's not in a good spirit with God, it is the primary responsibility of the husband to get her free time, to get her to sit down, and to get her relationship back with God. I mentioned with Jeanette, I will say, just, let's just drop everything, stop everything, go into the room, because you cannot be the husband of a woman who is backslidden. I'll use the term, you know what I mean. You cannot love that person. She won't receive your love. She's out of sorts. So my primary responsibility as a husband is to keep my eye on her. And if she loses her glory, if she loses her grace, I say, Jeanette, it's a bad day. Now you need to go into the closet and seek God and get your grace back. I'm your husband. And there is a disciplinary role. And this is part of it. Right? Because a woman like that is nobody's wife. She's out of control. The first primary role of a husband is that. It's to make sure she's covered. It's a form of discipline. And you need to, you know, see that through. Secondly, you need to make sure that your wife has fellowship with you. That she's spending time with you. You need to give her that time. Women like to talk. And talk. And talk. One of you. Women like to talk. In fact, I would say they need to talk. There's a communication thing there, and you need to provide that. You need to make sure that she has time with the church. If you remove the coal from the fire, that coal is going to grow dim. 
she needs friends she needs you know friendship within the church you need to make sure that's happening number three you need to provide her spiritual gift or seek her spiritual giftings and confirm that affirm that with her see what you know seek god if she doesn't know what they are number four you should be bringing your wife a word a word from the lord from time to time you may often see me on friday night turn across and either lay hands on Jeanette or speak to her. And it's the most natural thing in the world for me to do that. I'm seeking God for the church, but God will start in your own home first. And here we are. Is it, you need to say sorry? Sorry. You need to say this. You need to talk about this or talk about that. And we do. So you need to seek God for a word. And fifthly, gentlemen, and this is a really important one, when you pray with your wife, you need to pray out loud. <laughs> Right? You know there's no such thing as silent prayer. You know that? Not the word prayer. The word prayer means to cry aloud. So your voice is heard. And anything else is actually contemplation or meditation, but it doesn't, you know, technically come under the biblical category of prayer, which means to cry aloud. And, you know, you will ask many men, do you pray, you know, with your wife? And, oh, yes, yes, I pray for my wife on the way to work in my car silently or whatever that's not it she needs to hear your voice she needs to hear what you're praying very comforting provide great security just in doing that now you could ask well why on earth if this is so simple why on earth is it such a big problem if this is that simple why don't men do that why are so many marriages struggling along these lines answer well number one because there's no role model maybe a lot of the fathers were not saved they didn't have any i had a fantastic role model and my dad was wonderful on these things but a lot of the men did not have that secondly because men need training we need to go through training but thirdly they avoid the training <laughs> right i tell you they do it's the hiding thing from genesis so just simple reasons are the reasons why they don't take their place. So spiritual intimacy is a beautiful, wonderful thing, and it really should be the starting place for any relationship. The second one then, soulish intimacy. Remember the four Greek words for love. They're very important because they pop up all through your life. Agape, sturge, filio, and eros. Agape love is God's love coming through us. Sturge is family love, the love you have for your mom, your dad, your brother and sister. Philia love is friendship love. And eros is erotic love. And really soulish intimacy with your partner is the philia love. It's the friendship, the companionship. I think it's just fantastic. And what, a, what poverty we are in if we don't have friendship. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it says there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother right and that word friend there is the word associate and it means this there is someone who will stick with you through it all there's someone who'll still be there who will still love you in spite of this in spite of that they'll still be there that's the of course it refers to jesus but it doesn't only refer to jesus it refers to the one there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother, and it undoubtedly refers, it refers to the faithful love of a spouse. Hallelujah. Jesus is stuck by you. Amen. Through your good times and bad, and so we need to stick with each other. Soulish intimacy for me is absolutely huge. I think it's the most wonderful part of marriage. It's certainly the biggest part right? You're not going to spend all your time in point one, spiritual intimacy. I'm not going to spend all my time praying with Jeanette. That's not going to be the dominant part of our relationship, right? And point three, you're not going to spend all your time having sex. I mean, Pastor Elia, wouldn't that be ridiculous? Amen. <laughs> you're not. So it's not going to be number one, and it's not going to be number three. The bulk of your time is actually going to be spent in soulish intimacy. Do you get it? If you don't have a friendship, then the bulk of your marriage is going to fall apart. You need to develop a, a friendship 
with your husband or wife. Start to do stuff together. Go a bit crazy, you know? Do some mad stuff. You look a bit funny there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Enjoy life. Go out and, and, and spend time together. We, when we were in, in Ireland, they said there was going to be this night where they were going to do line dancing, country and western line dancing, you know? I remember looking at Jeanette, and we both looked and smiled at each other. Let's do it! And we went down there, and you had to grab your partner by the hand. And away we went. It was hilarious. It was exhausting. But, I mean, we really enjoyed that. And you've got something to talk about. At the moment, about a year and a half ago, we started Keep Fit. And we've actually kept it up considerably. We go about two, three times a week to the gym. And actually this week, something we can do together. This week, we both beat our personal best. She ran three kilometers without stopping. That's just fantastic. Amen. And this week, I began to stir my own tea. I thought that was a good start. I'm only joking. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But we, we both beat our own personal best. And we went home, we bought a box of Cadbury's chocolate mini rolls, and we ate the lot. Amen. <laughs> Do stuff together. If you're bored, don't complain about it. Don't complain about it if you don't do just simple, you know, simple little things. Go out and enjoy life. Don't get so spiritual that you think it's all just that one thing. It isn't. It was never really intended to be, right? Remember David and Jonathan. What does it say about David and Jonathan? God knit their souls. So, now I'm not talking about soul ties. That's a bad thing. I'm talking about soul mates. That's a wonderful thing. A fantastic thing. A friend to have through life. A friend that sticks closer than a brother. Fantastic. So these things, by the way, they build on one another. So you see someone, you meet someone, you think they may be your partner. You need to first of all start at point one and see if there's any spiritual dynamics between you, any symmetry between you, and figure that out because you're going to need that. That man, for instance, if you're a woman, he's going to have to lead you, right? He should be further on than you. He's going to have to lead you. And if he can't lead you, then you probably need to keep on looking. Okay? The male is the leader. It's right through your scripture. Now, he may take time to develop. So if he's weak or whatever, not a problem. You can, you, you, you can help him. You're the Ezer Kenegdo. You're the helpmate. I will make a suitable helper for him. Remember, it's not just housework. The helper was to help the man grow in the Lord. Primary role of the woman, to aid him. I have a great helper. You see? I have a fantastic helper. And that's helped me along all the way. And that means she's blessed. It comes back on you. But if you don't see that, impoverished for it. It starts at number one, that spiritual intimacy. Do I see that there's something in this man that I can relate to? And listen, guys, by the way, see if you're just about to ask a girl to marry you. Number one question, <laughs> will she follow me? You're going to boss me around. Who's going to wear the trousers in the house? Serious question. Isn't that, you know, as I said the other week, many women think their husband's like a little puppy dog. Come on, hi, come on. He's cute, isn't he? Cute. And it's not like that. You've got to deal with that and get that out of your system. Don't marry a man who you look upon like that. You've got a bad perspective. And men, you should never marry a dominant woman in that regard. That's completely out of kilter. It's wrong. Seriously wrong. Both parties have got flaws there. Okay? So s spiritual intimacy is the starting place. It leads to soulish intimacy where you can start. You've, do you understand? You've got a common ground in, in the Spirit. Now, with that security of mutual you know, moral boundaries, you can now start to socialize and relate to one another. She feels safe within the boundaries that he offers. Then and only then do we move to number three, sexual intimacy. Don't start anywhere else because it shouldn't. Remember, all good sex comes out of a good relationship. 
you got a bad relationship, I guarantee you, you're going to be having bad sex. Now, I don't think there is any subject on earth, any issue on earth, that the devil has declared war on more than this one. <laughs> I reckon the devil has declared war not just on the church in the area of sex, but on the whole world and everybody in it. The age in which we live has gone utterly crazy. Do you remember when Germany invaded Poland? I don't know if you follow it. I used to be fascinated with the Second World War, but there was hardly a shot fired, you know? They raised up, and we're going to enter in total passivity. And they were able just to march down those streets. And I think when the devil decided whenever that there was going to be a real surge on the issue of sex, it's almost like the church just went, okay. And that is a disaster. We should not be passive or silent on this issue. Amen. We need to think about it. We need to talk about it. I took a load of books to Armenia when I went there. And it's a very young church we've got there. Because the young people are not allowed to leave the country. That's the law. And one of the books was, most of you would probably have it. What's love got to do with it? Where it deals with all sorts of issues and dating and sex and AIDS and you name it. And all these guys are sitting around the room and they've already had the book and they've gone through and they're talking about the materials. And everything's okay. But there's this one girl sitting perplexed and a bit angry in the room, you know. And I thought, she's going to say something. And she did. She said, Pastor, I really don't know. She didn't speak like that. She's from Armenia. <laughs> I really don't know why we need to know about AIDS. Why do we need to know about dating and touching each other and what's right and what's wrong and i was delighted she asked the question because i was able to reply and help the whole room i said can i answer this just listen folks obviously we were in deep conversation you young girl are obviously from a christian home a virgin and you've been educated and brought up in the ways of god so you sit there, and from your world, your tradition, you say, why, well, I don't need to know. But what you fail to see is that at least 65% of the church doesn't share that tradition. They're not virgins. They are people who have been promiscuous in the world, who got saved when they were 20, 25, 30, 35, and they come in, and guess whose daughter they're sitting beside? yours so please don't tell me that we don't need to do this we need to do it and we need to educate the church about the age in which we live we weren't all brought up in christian homes we don't all know the ethics and standards that the bible teach and more and more so it's actually a fact it's a statistical fact there are now far more people getting saved from the world than there are from christian homes so the, the, there's an imbalance creeping in here. In other words, we're going to be surrounded very soon by people who had no Christian tradition. They were in the world. They were sleeping around. They bring in those habits. They bring in those parameters and standards to dating. And there's your problem. And we start to lose our young people. Don't talk about it. You must be joking. We need to talk about it all the time because it's they talk about it out there. And the church is absolutely silly on this issue. As I say, I've done probably 60 or 70 weddings, performed 60 or 70 weddings in the last 10 years. And out of that number, I reckon probably about one third were not virgins. These are obviously Christians or I wouldn't do the wedding. So about one third of that number were either people who had got saved later or whatever, had gone wrong, whatever it was. But about a third of that number were not actually virgins. And they, couple after couple after couple after couple, they come and sit in our living room. And the man will cry because the woman's not a virgin, or the woman will cry because the man's not a virgin, or they'll both be crying because they're both not virgins. And you see, part of a woman's anatomy is this miracle called the hymen. And on her wedding night, when the man penetrates her, he tears the hymen and blood 
is released. Now, doctors tell us that they have no, there's no reason for that to exist. It has no function. It has no medical function. It serves no purpose. Unless, of course, you've got a Bible. And then you understand its purpose. Its purpose is blood. Because all the covenants in Scripture are created in blood. So when the man marries the woman, marriage is a blood covenant. That's the reason. It has no medical function. It has a covenantal function. So many understand that and they come and they cry. How can we have a marriage under God? When my husband is not a virgin, when, when I'm not a virgin, we've ruined everything. We've wrecked our future. And it's exactly the same, not on this issue, but very similar to it in the book of Acts. When Jews were getting saved from a tradition, so they were becoming Christians, and Gentiles were getting saved, they were becoming Christians. And do you know what began to happen? The Jews started to think that they were better Christians than the Gentiles. They started to get proud and self-righteous. We've got a history. We've got a tradition. And all the apostles, Paul, Peter, you will see them speak into that pride and that self-righteousness and say, hey guys, everybody just hang on a minute. We're all one in Christ. You're not any better. And as our churches change, as the demographics of our churches change, let me tell you this as well. If you come from a Christian family, you're no better than someone who didn't in the eyes of God. It cost the same price to save you as it did to save them. It was the same Jesus. And couple after couple, when they come and they think their future is over, I am delighted to inform them that it isn't. I'm delighted to inform you, you may not be a virgin, my friend, but I guarantee you this, it doesn't have to make a difference in the covenant because you have forgotten one very important point. And I have yet to meet a man or woman who understands it. Never. It's always been. I've always had to inform people as they weep in front of me. I have yet to meet the person who understands it. So the couple come in. It's ruined! You have forgotten one very important point, and it's this. There is another blood. There is another blood. And when Christ died on the cross... He didn't, it wasn't just the healing of sickness or the driving out of demons. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. When you come to Christ, behold, all things have been made new. And I, I mean, tell people that, folks. Spread the good news. If, if someone's born again and they're tortured by the life, the promiscuous life they had, you tell them all things, all things. So whether your fiancé whether that man has been promiscuous or your wife or your fiancé, whether she has slept around, I tell you this, on the day of your wedding, you can enter the hall and you can proudly bring that man, proudly bring that woman before God because they've passed through the blood, the blood, which makes all things new. Hallelujah. Sex is a huge issue, absolutely huge issue. And within your marriage, I pray that you get, as that groom would on that day, you get the eyes of Christ for your partner. Amen? Tonight, we're going to continue enemies of intimacy. Understanding the things that drive us apart as couples, particularly in the sexual area, we'll deal with it Sunday after Sunday. On the back of your notes, you'll get a little inclination of where we're going tonight. It's unrealistic expectations. <coughs> Excuse me. Unrealistic expectations will kill you. <coughs> you really need to, to get a handle on what to expect and what not to expect. Remember when President Obama just got elected? I don't know if you followed that election, but on the day that he got elected, they stuck a microphone in this woman's face and they said, What does it mean to you that President Obama has been elected? And her reply was absolutely ridiculous. She said, oh, I won't have to worry about health care anymore. I won't have to worry about my mortgage. I was, I was scared about that, but now it's going to be okay. I couldn't get BBC One on my remote control, but now it's going to work. Everything's going to be rosy. 
And as they sat and listened, you see, it's the Messiah. Really looking for a Messiah. Someone who's going to solve all my problems. What a daydream. Great expectations. We need to get those expectations into perspective. And tonight we're going to look and work our way through this list. Like the first one, for example. I'm very unhappy as a single person. I can't wait to get married. So at last I'll be happy. True or false? The second one. The woman says, my fiancé, he doesn't pray, he doesn't tithe, but don't worry about it. After we get married, I'll sort him out. True or false? And we're going to look at these and work our way through them. So singles, don't miss tonight. Because you need to know that stuff very well. Marrieds, part of the reason that homes are often so unhappy is expectations, false expectations, are not being met. So that's at 6.30 tonight. Thank you for listening to today's program. I trust you have been blessed and edified by what you've heard. I want to ask you to do something, and that is to become a partner with us here at Preparing the Way. By doing so, you can help us to take these essential messages out to many other nations, many other people around the world. You can become a partner by visiting our website, preparingtheway.tv and there you will find many ways that you can join up. Folks, it is a pleasure and an honor to partner with you in bringing in the end times harvest. God bless you and once again, thank you for listening.